is back for the number 10 in the series of Who Is She? Um, famous Forgotten Females from Art History. I'm Tilly Strauss, an artist and art historian from um, New York, Dutchess County, New York. And I want to thank the Inspiration Arts Group for having me on here, giving me this platform that has helped me push this project to fruition each. It was supposed to be one a month thing, and I started last March, but towards the end, it got a little bit harder to meet some deadlines. But I'm so thrilled to be able to finally present the last in this series. And I've, I've learned a lot as I've been going on. So thank you for being here with me. I hope that you've enjoyed the other stories. And let me just tell you about um, Annie Albers. Okay, she's um, actually born Annalise Elsie Fleischmann. And she was a pioneer of weaving who both reduced and expanded the medium in ways that have fundamentally reframed um, the language of textiles. Um, she spent her life exploring the potential of the thread, and she situated herself in um, two major schools where she could teach others, and therefore she became a massive um, influencer of the 20th century. Um, one of the, I have an image here of a loom, and I just wanted to share with you that the way the loom is wired up, and it's very, it can be very complex. I'm not a weaver, but there's a warp and a weft, and the warp are the are the strings that run um, vertically in the background, and the and that's kind of how you you set up your whole um, fabric in the beginning. And the weft is like the shuttle there that you will bring back and forth. Um, horizontally and weaving it through the strings as you as you weave your pattern. And so this led me to think, I mean, when you read about the way Annie writes about um, weaving and designing, it'll it'll just change your your thoughts on a lot of things. And one thing that um, came to me and the way I'm designing the zine, my zine that I make about her, is to divide it into the warp and the weft. And the warp is going to be like what what you're given in life, and the weft, how you move your shuttle through the, the things and what you make of your life. So the warp, the first warp of Annie's early life um, is she was actually, she's born in 1899, and so she lives through the horrors of World War I. And she's in Germany. Um, and after World War I, this, when she kind of comes of age, um, there's a huge, large destitute population that is drawn to the cities in hopes of jobs in the factories and in the new industrialization markets that are happening. And they're literally coming from the trenches and it's a social crisis. There's a, a lot of hunger and poverty and um, scarification. And among the artists and thinkers of the time is this feeling that the world has to be rethought of, that um, things have to change. So the weft is basically um, Annalise. She's the oldest of three siblings born to a very wealthy Jewish family. On her mother's side, it was um, a, um, a publishing um family. And on the father's side, it was furniture, um, furniture dealing. And she had, um, she had an early, early memories of her childhood were like, when her parents would put on plays, they would have a whole staff come in and change everything out of the, out of the household and the living rooms and everything and put up new furniture and scrims and backdrops. And, and her parents would put on these plays and, and she just was uh, entranced with how little or how much you could do to just transform a space. And this will become something that um, she revisits in the rest of her life. She had a very rebellious nature and she took many different art lessons. And at the age of 16, she went to Dresden, hoping to study with Oscar Kokoschka and he turned her down. Um, she rebelled against her early art tutor, Martin Brandenburg, because he told her, you know, not to ever use black paint. And she just became a lot for her family to handle. She had to really face down their disapproval when she first went to um, Hamburg, where she studied um, to, for two semesters in applied arts. And that's where her friend gave her a brochure about this new school in Weimar, the Bauhaus. 
you know, on telling her father, the furniture ma manufacturer, about the Bauhaus, he replied, you know, what do you mean a new style? We've had the Renaissance. We've had the Baroque. There are no new styles. So it's just kind of funny what you'll see happen next. So the Bauhaus literally translates into the word building house. And it's a... Um, it's a utopian government experiment. They're hoping um, to put some of the people to work um, with some new production ideas. It's a groundbreaking school of design and it's aimed to marry craft and mass production. And basically the idea that um, we can make aesthetic objects for the common people. Art is no longer just solely for the, a luxury of the rich. Um, it was the first school that was open to both men and women, which was pretty cool. And Gropius, Walter Gropius was the founder, and there's a picture of him. He called the architecture and arts and crafts of the previous generation, quote unquote, a lie. He said, this is a new revolution in both style, embracing new materials, and we're going to um, get re reject any embellishment. We're going to get to the truth of each object. So the first school was located in Weimar in 1919. Then there's some government issues and they moved to the industrial city of Dessau in 1925 and lastly to Berlin in 1933. Well, it's, this is the school um, that, that brings on, it's one of the, the schools of thoughts that brings on what we call now today modernism which was a design movement responding to the industrial revolution with which focused on social change and rejection of the past. It was anti-ornamental and it braced um, geometric shapes, primary colors, the simplicity of um, design and using modern technology and modern industrial materials. The, this purity of art and design was not solely just a German thing. It had actually, um, manifested itself in the futurism movement of Italy in 1909 and in the constructivism movement in Russia in 1913. The artists, they focus on um, typography, architecture, ceramics, and just hoping to make um, objects that would have a wide ranging impact in society. And before I go to another page, I just want to point out that another woman left out of history a lot is Marianne Brandt. She was another student at the Bauhaus at the same time that um, Annie Albers was there. And she actually created the most successful commercial object to come out of the Bauhaus, which was a table lamp you see in the middle there from 1928. That was her design. But a lot of this, um, these design things were made were brought out, um, it was the whole idea of being an anonymous person. You didn't sign your work. This was art for the masses. So the Bauhaus um, stated actually that anybody of good repute without regard to age or sex will be admitted. Um, but um, unexpectedly by the masters, um, the enrollment of women far surpassed, um, the, or the application of women, far surpassed the numbers of the men. And this kind of freaked the, the, the masters out. And they decided to limit the number of women and to channel the women exclusively into either pottery, bookbinding, or weaving workshops. Um, Gropius, the founder, thought that men and women um, thought differently. And he wrote at some point that he thought that women thought in two dimensions and men in three dimensions. So, but what actually happened is the pottery master totally resisted this and the book binding workshop kind of dissolved. So as a consequence, all these women, and then what you'll see here, this is the staircase scene is called, you know, the weavers of the Bauhaus. Um, they studied textiles and it wasn't just weaving. It was embroidery, decorative edging, crocheting, sewing, like theater costumes and, and, um, and macrame. But the primary focus of the Bauhaus, the apex of study, would have been architecture. That seemed to be the, the hierarchy of it. And these are two houses on the side um, designed, two of several houses designed by Walter Gropius, and they're for the teachers. Um, they're called the master houses. And you can see how they really um, 
adhere to the horizontal and vertical and the lack of embellishment. Okay. So the weft, what does Annalise bring to this thing? Well, she comes to the Bauhaus in 1922 and she wants to study painting. And actually she, she's interested also in the glass workshop because she's interested in plexiglass, which is a new material that was made during World War I for um, the gun turrets. And it could be spray painted and covered, um, but you could still see through it. And this is a just a, an early sign of her interest in these sort of industrial man-made um, materials. But, um, she was denied entry and um, Joseph, who she met, Joseph Albers in the glass department, he helped her with her portfolio. To apply to the, the Bauhaus, you, it was a very simple thing. You needed to have examples of your drawing or craft work. You had to have a curriculum vitae of what you've done before, a character reference by the police, a medical health certificate, a photograph, and if applicable, any other certificates of previous training. And you had to be at least 17 years old. So when she finally gets in, she's pushed off to the weaving and she did has admitted and did admit um, that she thought weaving was a bit sissy. She was not thrilled about this. The teacher of the weaving at that point was Paul Clay and there's a paint photograph of him up there. And he was not exactly um, a strong teacher um, though he was mostly absent-minded and doing his own thing, but he taught by example. And a lot of the students in the weaving department had to kind of figure out um, the techniques on their own of weaving. But Clay wrote in 1915, I thought this was interesting, that, quote, the more horrifying this world becomes, the more art becomes abstract, while a world at peace produces realistic art. And I thought that was um kind of spoke also to the Bauhaus embrace of abstraction and the timing of everything. He'll tell Annie to follow the line. And that's something she's going to do. She's going to follow the thread for the rest of her life. Um, there are other women at the Bauhaus, which I've found with all these women that I've been studying that they're not, they're not, you know, an island into themselves. They actually are surrounded by other women. Now um, the bottom middle picture is Gunta Stoltz. She's, um, she taught Annie weaving and experimentation. She was actually one of the only female masters at the Bauhaus. And um, she, under her, Annalise would create curtains and carpets and upholstery and wall hangings. And during the Second World War, which comes up, she flees to Switzerland and runs a thriving weaving business there. And the other good friend of Annalise on the lower right is um, Gertrude Arndt, um, A-R-N-D-T, and she was born in 1903 and died in 2000, and she tried architecture at the Bauhaus, She, but she was really faced with a pretty hostile environment, and so then she was forced into weaving, and she really didn't like that, and she turned to photography. So her, she's mostly known for that right now, but I love this picture of her in the wood shop. Um, her photos include many self-portraits of her in disguise, and uh, she's a very interesting artist. And this is a, uh, an image of Gunther Stoltz's piece on the left and Annalise Fleischmann's on the right. And um, I just thought they were pretty interesting to compare and contrast the way. And you'll see that Annalise has this sort of classic um, balance to her work, even though it's not... Um, it's not a pattern. She's at this point, her writing, this is another trait of these, of these famous forgotten women is that they're writers. And she has written articles that will be published in 1924. A couple of different magazines published about um, her writing that promotes the Bauhaus ideas of design for the efficiency of the 20th century. Also in 1926, illustrations of her wall hangings get um, selected into a portfolio by Sonia Delaunay. And so she's getting quite some coverage. She's also designing curtains for um, theaters in Dessau and in Opelin. So this wall hanging of hers on the right in 1927, um, she taught herself how to use the jacquard loom. And I don't know, I didn't know much about the jacquard loom, but the jacquard loom is actually not just a loom. It's a device that fits on a loom that uses 
a stack of punch cards that can make very complex designs um, when they're laced together in a continuous sequence. And it's actually the multiple rows, rows of holes punched. Um, each card corresponds to one um, row in the design. And this is an important um, div tool that, An that Annalise is learning and te teaching herself because this actually helps them when they make samples of fabric, this helps them translate it to an uh, industrialization. Like this can be taken, these, these patterns and these punch cards can be taken and to a factory where they can reproduce this fabric according to this design in, in huge scale. Um, this is also the beginning of the com of computing hardware. And when I learned about um, working on a computer in the 1980s, we were still using punch cards. But threading, I just bring it up because threading of the jacquard loom is so intense that even the most simple, small loom, it can take days to get to do the rethreading and get the, all the warp ends in place. Annalise will always stay true to the idea of using horizontals and verticals. And she's the first artist to celebrate um, textile as a purely abstract interaction between the weaver's mind and the threads in the loom. So um, none of her work, like I said, is a straight pattern. There's always surprises. And she she puts in these, these pieces new materials like metallicized threads or plastic or things that are being made in the German factories. And she marries those with um, natural found um, like cotton and reeds and things like that. So here's a wall hanging from 1925 and I tried to zoom in and give a little detail of it. Um, this is silk, cotton and acetate. Acetate is a new um, material that, that is on the market at this point. So she calls these, Annie is gonna call these pictorial weavings. And um, like paintings and sculptures, these are supposed to hang on the wall and just be contemplated. She says they're like visual resting places that provide a welcome respite and diversion from daily life. So I think it's interesting. Yes, in 1925, Annie and Joseph are gonna get they get married. There's I have a picture there of Joseph running the glass um, workshop, and that's those are a sample of his um, windows that he's made. Um, she takes this opportunity to shorten her name to Annie Albers. So Joseph Albers was born um, in the Bottrop, Germany, a coal mining region, and he comes from a huge family, like mult, you know almost a dozen siblings. And his father um, was a craftsman and his maternal grandfather was a blacksmith. And he always um, gave credit to his humble origins saying that that was the key to his talent and his ability to use minimal means for maximal effect. Now, she's more embarrassed about her family. There's a story about her two uncles visiting the Bauhaus and they drive up in this opulent convertible vehicle and she's like, get out of here, you know, and she shushes them along and just doesn't want them around. She doesn't want people to know that she comes from this wealth. When she brought Joseph to meet her family, she was a little nervous about how it was going to go over because he's definitely not in the same class that her father would probably expect for from her life, but they love him. They, um, they're they intensely grateful that he has taken Annie sort of off of their hands and given her sort of this passionate um, way of, of expressing herself. And, and the two of them seem definitely a pair. And he also fixes things around the place. So he he's a, fa a favorite for the, um, the Fleischmann family. They go off to Italy for their honeymoon. And when they return at this point, um, the campus has moved from Weimar to Dessau. And they are actually able to live in one of those um, master houses that Walter Gropius set up. So that's pretty exciting. 
Okay, so this is a, one of the, the the pinnacle of her of her education. Annie designs a two sided. This is a, these are two samples of it. Sound absorbing, light reflecting, durable fabric, and it's for the Bernal Auditorium. Which the new now Walter Gropius has been moved out of the uh, the Bauhaus, and the new leader is Hans Meyer, a Swiss architect, and he's designed this um, huge auditorium, and she but it turned out that it wasn't holding the sound so well. So she designs this fabric to line the walls and also it lightens the place up. It's um, she uses on the front, she uses cellophane to weave through it. And that's a, that's a new native product from the German factories. And on the back, she uses a cotton chenille, which absorbs the sound and dampens the sound. And this actually earns her a diploma. The photograph down at the bottom is a, bunch of the weaving ladies celebrating with their diplomas. Um, and that is the name of the, of the, um, of the auditorium. It's a long name. So uh, yes, let's go on. This is okay. Here's a sample. I wanted to show you one of um, Joseph's um, stained glass pieces. His glass piece is, a, is up at the top left. And then Annie's weaving is over at the right. And um, basically, um, in 1930, Hans Meyer, the head of the of the Bauhaus, is dismissed without notice from the city of Dassau because he's been supporting the students' support political commitment to the workers' rights. Um, his successor is Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And Annie, who's now graduated, got her degree and everything, she's made head of the weaving department. And that's her at the loom there. Um, so I just thought the, the two pieces, Joseph's piece and Annie's piece were, were a nice pairing. And that the two of them form this sort of lifelong partnership. They're searching for the same sort of reduction and spirit in the design. The school struggles um, and moves for the third time and the last time to Berlin. But in April 1933, the Gestapo um, searched the Bauhaus and imprisoned 32 students, and they sealed the building. Um, after much pleading with the authorities, um, Mies van der Rohe is, able, is given a, a compromise of sorts, and they say that the Bauhaus can stay open as long as they throw out all the Jewish students and fire all the Jewish professors. And at least 200 of the 1,200 uh, members of the Bauhaus were of Jewish origin. So the school opts to shut its doors instead. Now, at, um, Hans Meyer will go on to Russia to join the Red Brigade and then move to Mexico. Gropius will emigrate to England in 1934. And Van der Rohe ends up um, in Chicago in 1933. Um, at least 14 Bauhaus members um, will die in concentration camps. And of those that survive, they'll take the Bauhaus ideas and help found new schools in other parts of the world. And there were Nazis in the school. Um, student Fritz Ertel, he took the modern construction ideas and he actually created the killing machines at Auschwitz. So here's the warp. It's the rise of anti-Semitism. Um, Annie is of Jewish descent, but she was um, she wasn't baptized. Uh, she was baptized, I think. Um, pro I wasn't. I'm not sure, but she she actually says she was only Jewish in the sense of in the Hitler sense. But it's definitely affecting their life. Um, the Bauhaus is closed. The teachers are forced to emigrate. Um, the art of the Bauhaus is considered degenerate by the Nazis and anything that's in museums is confiscated by um, August 1937 and sold to a lot of foreign collectors to fund the Nazi government. Annie and Joseph have this apartment in Berlin and this is a, a one of this is the outside of the building there. Um, and they completely renovated it by stripping it down and they've covered all the floors with this new material called Formica. It's all white. For Micah. And they have this pivotal meeting with Philip Johnson. He's an architect from New York City. He works at the MoMA. And there's a picture of Philip Johnson and Alfred Barr from MoMA on the on the front of a boat 
crossing the Atlantic probably to Europe. And um, um, jo um, Philip Johnson had been to the Bauhaus in the 1920s and he was a big fan of the school's ethos. But this time he runs into Annie on the streets and, and she invites him to her apartment for tea. He's completely charmed by her and he's blown away by their apartment. That's all this white in simplicity. And he writes that they served him tea out of chemistry beakers, little glass beakers, because they tried to avoid any embellishment, uh, embellished objects in their lives. So he's friends with um, teachers at the Black Mountain College, and it's eager to get the Albers to the United States. So Black Mountain College is an experimental college in North Carolina, was an experimental college. This is still like the background. This is the warp. Um, <coughs> it, was, it was started by John Rice, and it lasts from 1933 to 1957. And the ethos is like um, John Dewey's learn by doing. And what happened is there was a slew of popular teachers at Rollins College down in North Florida, and they all resigned at once and decided to purchase a campus in the Carolinas and start a unique school. So in this school, there's no hierarchies, but none between age, between gender, between race, between practice, between teachers and students. It's the first American student that admits non-whites as equals. And it functions on a shoestring, really. They, they have to build the campus from scratch. Everyone grows their own food. They all work on a little farm together for the food. They build their own furniture, and everybody eats together. Um, the teachers and the board members include Albert Einstein, Walter Gropius, Elaine de Kooning, Gwendolyn Knight, Mary Gregory, and Hilda Morley. So, um, so this is the weft. It's through Philip Johnson that the Albers are invited to America and her life is saved. You know, both their lives are saved, probably from further Nazi persecution. Um, six weeks after his tea with the Albers in their Berlin apartment, they receive a letter um, of employment to the Black Mountain College. And the words experimental school are what excites them the most. Joseph is hired and he says, my wife will bring her loom. So Alfred Barr, of the newly founded Museum of Modern Art, he'll travel with them across the ocean, give them a tour of New York City, and then take them down to North Carolina, where they're going to create the art department at Black Mountain College, and they're going to stay there for 16 years. They have um, a hands-on philosophy of teaching that involves um, deep material studies. She's going to create a powerful weaving and design program, and her work will embrace, um, you'll find the ancient and the most modern techniques, everything you know she, that um, she's brought from the Bauhaus, but she's going to go deeper into it. That's a picture of her using a, um, a hand loom on the right. And that's a picture of Joseph teaching and he's down on the ground um, and he um, teaching with his students on the left. So what happens is actually Annie starts teaching before her loom actually arrives. So without a loom, she breaks down the thinking process and she concentrates on texture and the feeling of textiles. Um, in this manner, the students use like they punch holes through paper to get texture. They use her Olivet typewriter to create, you know, patterns like there. And they um, use seeds from their their farm that they're working and, and glue. So they, they create sort of weavings with all sorts of other materials. She also uses um, washers and implements and stuff and creates jewelry and she'll do a collaboration. Um, you can still buy some of this stuff. It's a collaboration with Alexander Reed. So um, the breadth of her influence, she, she teaches like everybody goes through her department, um, really. And so she teaches Cy Twombly, Kenneth Nolan. She's um, friends, lifelong friends with faculty members, Buckminster Fuller, William and Elaine de Kooning, Ben Sean, Robert Motherwell, Franz Klein. It's, um, it's an amazing place for her to spread her ideas and really distill them and come into contact with some of the really most interesting artists um, in America. Her, her, her 
um, what happens is a big breakthrough in 1949. She's given a solo show at the Museum of Modern Art and Philip Johnson will co-curate it with the museum's Department of Architecture and Design. She's the first woman to be given a show at MoMA, a solo show, and she's the first textile artist to be given a solo show. So um, it's pretty amazing. They select a ton of stuff. She has an enormous creative output at this point, including um, they include her, her wall hangings and her upholstery, but they also include her experimental educational pieces that she's done that's out of paper, corn, grass, and string. Um, she works with foil, metal, and just the marriage of her of natural fibers with man-made fibers is really an interesting thing. She's trying to, to push what can be done with like um, um, wrinkle-free, mold-free, all the you know all the different dyeing potentials of the new materials and. It's and it and creating these different desired effects. What's what you see behind the chair that's tilted are these wall dividers, and this still has this whole idea from the Bauhaus and everything of using. And Philip Johnson will use it in his architectural designs of using fabrics as walled as room dividers, and that's kind of cool. Um, basically, each school break. They traveled to Mexico and South America. And by the 1960s, they've done about 13 or 14 trips down there. In fact, that's why Joseph um, gets his driver's license is so that they can drive across country from North Carolina down to Mexico. Annie is fascinated with um, Peruvian weavers. This is a piece she did, and, and excavations. She's interested in the whole idea of excavations and digging down. And this Vicara rug is, Vicara is a new, as a man-made um, substance and wool and cotton in that piece. Um, she's fascinated because she loves the Peruvian aesthetic of creating something both beautiful and utilitarian. And they become collectors of pre-Columbian art. She's, um, she loves the abstract vocabulary, the dynamic geometric forms, and um, she shares herself this whole visual grammar based on abstraction. In 1947, they take a whole year off and go and live in Mexico and South America. They pretty much will return again and again to six locations um, outside Mexico City, um, in Oaxaca, and Chichen Itza down at the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. So they will collect something like 1,400 Mesoamerican sculptures and pottery shards from the 1200 BC and antique and modern Mexican textiles. They bring these, Annie brings these back to Black Mountain College as a teaching collection. And yet when Black Mountain College closes in um, 56, it's, uh, the collection is moved to Yale University and it's part of the Yale Peabody uh, Museum of Natural History. Some of it's there and some is also at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation in, in Connecticut. So anyway, this is a long story of how modernists find this fascination with non-European cultures and this re they're redefining a relationship between modern art and ancient craft. There's this belief that basically the further one goes back, the simpler things become and ultimately the more profound and direct and universal the expression of the work that's made. So that's what she's um, she identifies with and is is digging back. And sometimes she would buy these these tapestries just to unravel them, just to see how they were made. So, and one another a new period that she goes into in the '40s is knots, and um, definitely influenced by the Indi indigenous Quechua peoples. Um, and so she does these pieces and. They, they're they knotted as they go through the weft. There's also, at this time, a new math teacher at Black Mountain College. His name is Max Den, and he's also a German immigrant, and um, an immigrant from Germany. And he has a popular class on knots. He taught um, mathematics, philosophy, Greek, Italian, um, but his most, there weren't that many students at Black Mountain College who were 
just math students. So his most popular course was geometry for the artists. And Annie um, was quite drawn to him. She spent a lot of time with him. Um, I think it was a little bit of stress on the marriage too at this point. At the same time, she may have had been having some medical issues. She had suffered um, from this thing called Charcot Marie tooth disease, which affected her feet. And she had really high arches and hammer toes. And so for a while, working at the loom earlier had been all right. But now it had become it was more of a physical exertion. So it was harder for her to do that. At this time, um, Joseph has offered a job as chair of the department of the design department at Yale School of Art. And I think to everybody's relief, they head off that way. And 19, he'll be there from 1950 to 1957. And he'll revolutionize art education. Basically, our foundations courses in art that most of us have taken in school is can be directly linked to his philosophy of play and experimentation and learning the basics of all of each discipline across a wide range of media. So what does Annie do? She's now, she's no longer teaching necessarily. So she um, writes a book on weaving and it comes out in 1965. It's hugely popular and influential. Uh, you, I wrote, you don't have to be a, a weaver to love this. It's an incredible book. I think we should all own one. It's, it'll change your whole thoughts on textiles and space and sculpture. I mean, it just starts, she's a very easy read and she starts about how if you take two threads and bring them together at an angle and wind them, it's a braid. But if you take them at perpendicular to each other, it's a weave. And once you take two threads and do that and make a weave, you've got a, a, a plane, a pliable plane. And it's just, it talks about space and it's, it's just a really, really good book. And she dedicates it to the Andean weavers. She says, my great teachers, the weavers of ancient Peru. So um, she follows this book with another one called On Design, which is a bunch of different essays that are also been pre-published in other um, magazines and journals. And with them, she's combining the technique of craft with the language of modernism and with the respect of prehistory. So, you know, her, this becomes her most prolific period as far as disseminating her ideas. Um, she also takes up printmaking. And uh, Joseph had, had to, and she followed him along to the Tamarind, which is in New Mexico. And she studied some lithography. This was a, a new thing for her. So even though she didn't step inside a synagogue after the age of eight in 1950, a Texas synagogue commissioned her to create an ark covering. And this piece opened Annie up to a series of artworks connected to um, numbers in Judaism. And this is called the six prayers and the panels commemorate 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust and this was actually commissioned by the Jewish Museum in New York, and it's cotton, linen, bast, and silver thread. And it harkens back. If you zoom in and you can never see these, I was always torn between wanting to show the whole image of something and then a detail, but you have to zoom in. Um, her weaving is like this wandering text of a line. It's got the knots of the earlier stuff, but it harkens back to Paul Clay, who said, take a line for a walk. So during this time period, she's going to create two spiritual weavings for two different synagogues. And those are the last of her weavings. And she's going to use lurics and mixing it with jute, which is like a fi uh, natural fiber and cotton. And um, they're just as functional as they are beautiful. So, it, you know, not too many people know actually how she put together her stuff. But when this piece was um, conserved, by a textile conservator, they repaired the panels in 2010, said the fabric was woven entirely from colored Lurex yarns. And Lurex is a mid 20th century invention and um, it holds the dye really well and Albers would have just embraced, embraced that kind of technology. So 
Um, she does printmaking. These are some samples. She earns a fellowship to study at Tamarin, and she'll create a suite of seven lithographs that are just lines, like knotted lines, and they look a lot like um, Bryce Martin's um, works that I saw just re recently. Anyway, um, she follows that suite with a series playing off of triangles, and her patterns flow. They're kind of they're kind of chaos and order. It's um, She'll play with these for quite a bit. And then there's her notebook from 1970 to 1980. She, there's a published book of her drawings on graph papers. And um, these are end up being in a lot. She's working in a lot of partnerships. In fact, right now she's, um, by this time, she's in a wheelchair, which she'll be for the last 25 years of her life. She can't really move around very easily. And so she works with a lot of the master printers who take her, um, her designs and will like the, there's a piece called mountains, 1978. That's from these sketches and it's just embossed. There's no color at all. It's just the embedded in and relief in the papers. And then she'll also take her pencil and graph paper designs and take them to be adopted on embroidery machines and the machines will do it. She's still interested in the textile process, the thinking and the, the new tools and potential of industry. So it's really kind of great. So I just also want to follow up with that. The fiber arts um, history, it's, it's one of the oldest forms of expression and utilitarian craft um, in our in our mankind in our history, and yet it has always been relegated to women's work. And where women have a history in the home of creating samplers, embroidery samplers, and creating their own fabrics, none of that has been um, appreciated by the gatekeepers of the art world. In fact, when the Royal Academy of the Arts in London opened up within two years they banned all embroidery um, and declared that evidence of it wasn't even allowed at the school so there wasn't a way for women to bring that kind of experience or knowledge into the art world so what annie has done in this short time even though she thought it was too sissy to actually be in the weaving thing is she totally embraced it and took it as far as you know as she could at that time and and has passed the baton um these are some other artists that have also benefited from annie's time um ruth Asau was also at um, black mountain college and and a student of um the math the geometry in in uh art class and Sheila Hicks, she was at Yale with, um, studied under Joseph Albers and briefly informally with Annie. And there's all these others. Um, Paul Smith is a influencer and a British fashion designer who's used Annie's patterns because she kept notebooks and, and everything and he's replayed those. And these other artists, and they're all, I could tell you each about them, but there's somebody for you to look up as we go forward. Um, I want to. Um, this is this is a, a a photograph of their apartment, their house, their living room in um, Connecticut, and then my stack of books that I had for her that I got from the library. I'm very grateful to the library for um, finding these for me. Um, part of this this project has been wonderful, and that my library behind me has gotten a little bit more diverse as far as gender representation, and. Um, I've also just enjoyed this so much and I've, I'm so humbled by what I've learned and what I've uncovered by these women and how they've led their lives. And even in the darkest times, Annie was able to find beauty, light and inspiration. Another last thing I want to share, and I appreciate having this platform at Inspiration Art Group so much. It got me out there and everything is that we women don't do it alone. You know, there is a sisterhood, don't believe otherwise, um, but these women all had support from their girlfriends and people in powerful places, so you don't have to do it alone. Um, it takes all of us, reach out, and we can help each other, and um, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Have a great day. Bye.